Hello everyone, I would like to thank you for the audience. My name is Paulo Leandro. I'm part of the regulatory affairs team of LIBS. We focus in the DMF. And today I'm going to present you how a Brazilian pharmaceutical company is dealing with nitrosamines. First of all, we have to understand what is a nitrosamine. Nitrosamine are impurities that may increase the risk of cancer. And this is the basic structure of a nitrosamine. They have some radicals bonded to an amine, and this amine presents an aninitrose bond. And this is basically a nitrosamine. Here we have the most classical nitrosamines. When I mean that, when I mean classical, I'm trying to say that these nitrosamines come from the most usual chemicals present in the manufacturing process of some APIs or degradation products. And usually these nitrosamines, especially they, they present a very low acceptable intake in the order of nanograms day. Usually for mutagenic impurities, we work in the order of micrograms day. But why nitrosamines are mutagenic? To answer that, we have to think about the metabolism of amines, especially in the cytochrome uh, P450. There are two options for uh, metabolism of amines. You can have the N high oxidation or alpha hydroxylation, the bot one. Especially for nitrosamines, we go through alpha hydroxylation. When you have a nitrosamine, I mean, when you have this kind of structure, the N nitrose bond, it actually is not mutagenic. What makes it mutagenic is the metabolism. And as I show you, when a nitrosamine suffers a alpha hydroxylation, it may eliminate aldehyde. After that, it's going to form a N hydroxide and then it's going to eliminate water. When it, after this reaction, then you have the real danger. You have the alkylating agent. This alkylate agent, it's a diazonium salt. And when I have this N triple bond N, it's very, very reactive. It's a well-known chemistry uh, for alkylating. So, when we have the alkylate agent, the diazonium salt, it, can, it may react with the DNA, with the bases. And when this happens, you have the DNA methylation or alkylation. Depends. <laughs> and what does it cause? Well, when you have this alkylation of the DNA, you have the wrong pairing of the bases. That's why you have mutations. And this wrong pairing, it's because you block hydrogen bonds. Now that we have an idea about what is a nitrosamine and why is it mutagenic, let's talk about the evolution of the scenario. I present you by Alib's point of view. So everything started in 2018 with recall of a Valzertan. And after that, several recalls regarding other Zartans, Lozartan, Nibizartan. And then, in the beginning of 2019, Anvisa started to perform audits, in local audits, in order to evaluate the possibility of contamination in the products containing Zartans. Right after that, in May, they published the first RDC regarding control of nitrosamines in Brazil, the 283. But this, this resolution is only about Zartans. But nitrosamines, it's not like a class of impurities that were present only in Zartans. It's a chemical reaction. So it was present in 
any kind of drugs, any kind of medicines that could present this kind of reaction. And then, as we can see, during all this time, we have several reports of contaminations, pioglitazone, ranitidine, metformin, uh, and others. So it's not about a class of drugs. It's more a chemical reaction. And also in 2019, the EMA published the first guideline regarding the control of the portfolio regarding nitrosamines impurities. And in January of 2020, Anvisa started to follow the guideline and publish it the first uh, recommendation for control in the portfolio. However, right after the publication, it was revoked and it started a, a very long discussion between agency, entities, regulated sector about how nitrosamine should be controlled in Brazil. We have a working group that is starting October 2020 that finishes the the resolution, the proposal of the resolution in April, when it was published the first um, minute. And then in June, we have the public consultation, the 1050. As you saw in the previous timeline, the public consultation was only published this year. But the alarming, it started in 2018. Then Anvisa started the audits in 2019. Libs, we start to make measures right after the audit we got because we understood that it was not about a class of compound, was not about certains, it was about chemistry. It's about um, a chemical reaction that could generate nitrosamine. Then, 2019, we start evaluating. APIs, the next year, we start to approach drug product and biological products, oh, both based in the EMA guidelines. And today, I'm going to present you how we plan this, uh, this control, how we evaluate, elaborate it. And today, like nowadays, in Leaves, we are implementing this workflow. Basically, the control, it is realized in three steps. The risk assessment, confirmatory test, control strategy. But before everything, we should do the prioritization of our portfolios to identify which products present more risk if they are contaminated. And for that, we have to use at least two parameters, the duration of treatment, and max daily dose. So, as higher is the duration of treatment and max daily dose, higher is the risk. And as lower they are, lower is the risk. And once classified the risk of the portfolio, then there was established a deadline for evaluation of each class of risk. For instance, products with very high risk should be evaluated until nine months of the resolution become effective and medium low and very low should be evaluated until 36 months after become effective and high risk until the first year. In Libs, we follow these parameters. We use those, the duration of treatment and also number of patients to create the prioritization and we got this distribution of number of products we have a crescent number that reached the top in the evaluation of 36 months basically medium low and very low risks so after make the matrix and then we can see what's the, the highest risk based in the maximum daily dose and treatment duration. We go to the step one. The step one 
is the risk assessment and that is elaborated to identify any kind of risk that could generate nitrosamines. But how to do that? How? What's the strategy to control nitrosamines? For that, we should remember that nitrosamine, they are uh, also mutagenic. So they could be controlled by ICHM7. And when we remember that, we have this, this kind of working flow. We have some steps. The hazard identification. After that, the dose re response evaluation. Then we evaluate the exposure. And finally, we have the risk characterization. I'm going to show you how we are doing this in LIBS. The step one, the risk assessment, is the most important step. Why? Because in this step, you properly identify the risk and classify the risk. And for that, you should consider both drug substance and product. In the API, you should evaluate the route of synthesis, all the intermediates and starch materials, reagents, solvents, recovering of that, the water, degradation, packing material, cross-contamination, cleaning validation. And beside that, for the drug product, you should evaluate the solvents, the process, degradation, the recipients, the compatibility between recipients and API, cross-contamination, packing material. We have a lot of parameters to evaluate. But how to do that? How, how have we done that? Well, in LIBS, we took all these parameters and put together in a matrix that follows the strategy of control according to ICHM7. For performing the step one, the first thing we have done was to elaborate a workflow. In this workflow, initially, we plan the activities of the DMF team regarding the API evaluation. Then we recruit analytical and packing material team in order to evaluate the drug product. And with the evaluation of all these three areas, we should meet and evaluate the potential risk of each product in a multidisciplinary team. After of the workflow, the next step was to plan how to make the evaluation. And for that, we elaborated this matrix that could be easily answered for any analyst and could cover all the risks associated to nitrosamine formation. And this matrix is very like, intuitive because you can have some easy answers and it can also be able to indicate what action should be done. And that's what we call the integrated risk analysis. But what is in this matrix? What we evaluated there? In the integrated risk analysis, what we have done was basically put all the parameters related to nitrosamine formation that I already have present you in a matrix that follows the strategy for control of mutagenic impurities according to ICHM7. And the first step was the hazard identification. This step actually presents two other steps. The first one is to identify if a nitrosamine can be formed. If yes, which nitrosamine can be formed? After we evaluate that, we should classify the impurities to understand if this impurity is mutagenic or not. So we have to understand how are nitrosamines formed to understand which nitrosamine could be present in our process. And for that, I'm going to use a very important tool that we have in synthesis. It calls retrosynthesis. What is it? Basically, 
you just broke your molecule, like the compound you want to to see how is it formed in the main bond. For us, is the any nitrous bond this one? Then you have these two structures: the nitronium ion and uh, amine ion. And where they are coming from? Well, the nitronium ion could be from the nitrous acid, and this amine could just came from another amine with the hydrogen, not the charge. And then you can go forward. This amine could come from another amine, like the secondary amine could come from a tertiary amine or another derivative. And this nitrous acid could come from sodium nitride. So we can consider that to make a nitrosamine, you should have a primary, secondary, or tertiary amine and or, or carbonyl derivatives. You also need a nitrogate agent that uh, that is basically a species that could generate nitronium ion and the right condition to have finally a nitrosamine. Now that we know what is necessary to form a nitrosamine, we can see the, the most classical mechanism. It's the secondary amine with a nitronium ion. So we have the pair of electrons of the, the amine that reacts with the nitrous ion. It forms an intermediate and after that it generates finally the NDMA. For instance, we will have the formation of a nitrosamine. But as I told you, that was the classical way. The classical way uses nitrogen agents. Besides that kind of reaction, you have all of these ones. And besides that, you have other mechanisms that also can generate nitrosamines. For instance, the oxidative one that can make the oxidation of hydrazines, for instance, by the air. Or you can have like partial reductions of nitramines. All of them are ways to form nitrosamines. That's why you have to understand in deep the chemistry behind your manufacturing process to have a robust approach to really identify the risk. So that's how you know if it's possible to form a nitrosamine and which nitrosamine can be formed. The next step is to classify these impurities according to ICHM7 to understand if they are mutagenic or not. According to ICHM7, an impurity can be classified from 1 to 5 according to its results of mutagenic. Starting from in silico methods, then we could use Derek and Sarah for the prediction of it. We can also classify based in the in vitro test. The NO has AIMS test and also by the results of in vivo tests of carcinogenic studies. That was the first step, evaluating if a nitrosamine can be formed, which one and what's the class of it. And the next one is the dose response evaluation. In this step, we should calculate the dose response according to the classification we got in the previous step. For instance, for class 1 compounds that they are no has a carcinogenic impurities, we should use the TD50 to calculate the acceptable intake. For impurities that are classified as 2 or 3, we should use the TTC for nitrosamines that are 18 nan nanograms a day. And for class 4 and 5, we can control as a normal organic impurity according to ICHQ3A and Q3B. After evaluation of which nitrosamine could be formed, what is its class, what's the dose, 
we go to evaluate the exposure. In this step, we have two options for evaluation of exposure. We have the analytical results that should be obtained by a development method, and we also have the push factor calculation. The push factor is basically the capacity of your process to, to separate API from an impurity based on the difference of reactivity, physical chemical properties, uh, volatility, solubility, and that's how a push factor calculation is done. For using the push factor calculation strategy, you have to find the purge ratio. The purge ratio basically is the overall predicted purge divided by the required purge. The required purge it's the level, uh, it's the it's a value of how much your process can dilute an impurity until the saved limit until to reach the safe limit. That's the required purge. And the overall predicted purge is a prediction of how you expect that this impurity will be purged or it is going to be diluted. The concentration will be reduced by the difference of reaction, physical chemical properties, solubility, volatility, and also physical process has like a chromatography for instance then with the ratio of these two values you find the purge ratio the purge ratio indicates if the control is necessary or not so if you have a high purge ratio of more than 1000 then your calculation it's supported by itself and according the, to the decrease of this value you have to support with more and more uh, supplementary data for instance the analysis of some batches this strategy is very common for api manufacturers and if you have no purge ratio like below one then you should follow the usual strategies and make the control in the API or in the intermediates. For a better understanding of purge factor, I strongly recommend the channel of Fernanda Verta. She is uh, working for Laza now and she's very expert in it on it. And coming back to the evaluation, we know if our product are able to have nitrosamine or not and then we just have to characterize the risk for that we should use the ICHM7 strategies basically compare the impurities level present in the API or drug substance with the acceptable limit according to ICHM7 we have four control options one, control the specification of the API or drug product. Two, three, in the intermediate. And four, justify no control based on the purge factor. But how this is related to our analysis? Basically, if I could justify there is no risk and I can justify the levels by purge factor, I can see there is no risk so I don't have to go to the confirmatory test phase. But if I had option one, two, or three, then I have a risk and I may go to confirmatory tests. And basically that's how we plan to perform our integrated risk analysis. And the next step well, was how to put everything together. For that, for the conclusion of the step one, we planned a meeting with all the teams, a multidisciplinary meeting to discuss if there is really a risk or not. 
and formalize it as a report. We have like a model of the report that should resume all the data we have uh, gathered during the risk analysis. Then, if we identify risk in the step one, in the risk assessment, we go for confirmatory tests, the step two. The step of confirmatory tests should start right after the identification of risk in the previous step, the step one. And then the companies have 36 months to make the confirmatory test and also apply these control strategies, that is stage three. All the, the methods used should be validated according to IRDC 166 or ICH Q2. And also the number of batch tested must to be established according to the risk assessment. This is in line with the public consultation. But we have some difficulties, we found some difficulties, mainly based on the sensitivity of the methods. Most of the companies, they don't have the equipments that are need to reach this sensitivity. Then we should like hire uh, 30 persons, 30 companies to evaluate the nitrosamines in our products. And sometimes it could take three months to get the result. Then it's very, it's a very long time to wait. So sometimes we are worried about that. And finally, we have the control strategy. In the step three, according to the results of confirmatory tests, you could have two scenarios. Presents within the limits, then you have only to include the test in the API or drug product specification, or in the worst scenario, you could have presents above the limits. When we have that, according to the public consultation, we have to do the recall and also carry out corrective measures. For instance, process chains, uh, replacement of API, ACPH or packed material suppliers, any measure that could uh, reduce the levels of nitrosamines. But we have some concern about the recall because sometimes the benefit risk assessment should be done for like safe life medicines or uh, single medicines that are in the market, sometimes the risk of the patient don't get the medicine, it's higher than the risk of nitrosamine. So it should be evaluated. Well, during all this process of development and working with nitrosamines, one thing we learned, it's uh, nitrosamine is bigger than we saw before, than we could expect. So we plan with three teams the strategy, then it's going to increase uh, getting quality team, pharmaceutical technical team. And we saw now that all the knowledge it's need to perform a, a good risk assessment. And also this process, it may take some time. This is a, an example of a, a timeline for implementation. And in the public consultation, we have only three months to become effective. So do we have time to make it right? Well, as I told you, the risk assessment of nitrosamine is a very challenging and complex process. And most of the time we are going to face puzzles and we're going to need a strong team to identify if we have absence of presence of risk and what kind of risk. To proper identify the risk, we must understand the root cause. And the only way to reach this is through the scientific knowledge behind each process. Because that's the only way to reach our goal, that is delivery, safe medicines to the patients. So we must evaluate in deep each process and with the right expertise, chemists, 
toxicologists, everyone that could help are welcome. I finally would like to thank you all and we are open for questions.